Good afternoon. Welcome to God's house here at Good Shepherd Lutheran Church. Uh, it's great to be able to be here with you uh, for the last of our Wednesday midweek Lenten services. Uh, also great to have people joining us uh, online streaming. Happy for that capability to be able to gather together as a family of faith this afternoon. Uh, we are continuing and, and sort, of, sort of completing our midweek series on the crucial hours as we look at these kind of pivotal moments of Jesus as leading up to his death on the cross. And today, this I'll explain later this whole apart for the whole thing, which is kind of an odd title, but uh, what it's really getting at is sort of a negotiation that took place between Pilate and the people on what should happen to Jesus. And we're gonna use that to sort of think about the little negotiations that we make sometimes, that we make with ourselves, uh, that we might even make with God when it comes to how we live our lives. And we're going to kind of think about that for a little bit tonight. But we'll start our service uh, by thinking about what our Savior did and what he accomplished for us as we sing our opening hymn, O Perfect Life of Love. of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We confess our sins before our Heavenly Father. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you in our thoughts, in our words, in our deeds, and in all that we have not done. Forgive us in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Deliver and restore us that we may rest in peace. By the mercy of God, we are redeemed by Jesus Christ, and in him we are forgiven. Let us rest in his peace until the rising of the sun, when we shall serve him in newness of life. Amen. And we'll join in singing our psalm of the day, Psalm 85.
Let us pray. God of love and faithfulness, you showed favor to your people by sending your one and only Son to be our Savior. Help us to trust in him as our gracious Redeemer and so enjoy the peace he came to bring, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now we hear our first graders who will be singing the song, There is a Green Hill. Special thanks to our first graders for that song and the story that they sang about on that green hill where Jesus was crucified is really what we're going to hear about in our, our final section of the Passion History reading, uh, which we will hear tonight. Two other men who were criminals were led away with Jesus to be executed. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of a skull. They offered him wine to drink, mixed with gall, but when he tasted it, he would not drink it. They crucified him there with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Now it was the third hour when they crucified him. Pilate also had a notice written and fastened on the cross. It read, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this notice because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city and it was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man said, I am the king of the Jews. 
Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier. They also took his tunic, which was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let's not tear it. Instead, let's cast lots to see who gets it. This was so that the scripture might be fulfilled, which says, they divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. So the soldiers did these things. Then they sat down and were keeping watch over him there. People who passed by kept insulting him, shaking their heads and saying, you who were going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. Those who were crucified with him also insulted him. In the same way, the chief priests, experts in the law, and elders kept mocking him. They said, he saved others, but he cannot save himself. If he's the king of Israel, let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now, if he wants him, because he said, I am the son of God. One of the criminals hanging there was blaspheming him, saying, aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, since you are under the same condemnation? We are punished justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for what we have done. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said to him, Amen, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus' mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene were standing near the cross. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the, to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that time, this disciple took her into his own home. It was now about the sixth hour, and darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun was darkened. At the ninth hour, Jesus shouted with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, Listen, he's calling Elijah. After this, knowing that everything had now been finished, and to fulfill the scripture, Jesus said, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine was sitting there. Immediately, one of them ran, took a sponge, and soaked it with sour wine. Then he put it on a stick and gave him a drink. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Suddenly, the temple curtain was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and rocks were split. Tombs were opened and many bodies of saints who had fallen asleep were raised to life. Those who came out of the tombs went into the holy city after Jesus' resurrection and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those who were guarding Jesus with him saw the earthquake and how he cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last, they were terrified and began to glorify God saying, this man really was righteous. Truly, this was the Son of God. When all the groups of people who had gathered to see this spectacle saw what had happened, they returned home beating their chests. All those who knew Jesus and many women who had followed Jesus from Galilee and who had served him were there, watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, Salome, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. Since it was the preparation day, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the crosses over the Sabbath, because that Sabbath was a particularly important day. They asked, they asked Pilate to have the men's legs broken and the bodies taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man who was crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other man. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear. Immediately, blood and water came out. The one who saw it has testified, and his testimony is true. 
He knows that he is telling the truth, so that you also may believe. Indeed, these things happen so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. Again, another scripture says, they will look at the one they pierced. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews. Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, was a good and righteous man. He had not agreed with their plan and action. He was looking forward to the kingdom of God. He boldly went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised that Jesus was already dead. He summoned the centurion and asked him if Jesus had been dead for a long time. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he granted the body to Joseph. Joseph bought a linen cloth, came, and took Jesus' body away. Nicodemus, who earlier had come to Jesus at night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 72 pounds. They took Jesus' body and bound it with linen strips along with the spices in accord with Jewish burial customs. There was a garden at the place where Jesus was crucified, and in the garden was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. So they laid Jesus there because it was the Jewish preparation day and the tomb was near. Joseph took the body and laid it in his own new tomb that he had cut in the rock. He rolled a large stone over the tomb's entrance and left. The women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed after Joseph, and they observed the tomb and how Jesus' body was laid there. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Jesus, were watching where the body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and perfumes. On the Sabbath they rested according to the commandment. On the next day, which was the day after the preparation day, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered in the presence of Pilate and said, Sir, we remembered what that deceiver said while he was still alive. After three days I will rise again. So give a command that the tomb be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples might steal his body and tell the people he has risen from the dead. And this last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard. Go, make it as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and posting a guard. This is the passion history of our Lord. We'll continue with our next hymn, Jesus I Will Ponder Now.
Grace, mercy, and peace are yours. From God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, The portion of God's Word that we're going to look at, uh, just a couple of verses from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 23. And I'll read them for us and we'll talk it through a little bit. Uh, Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, and said to them, You brought me this man as one who is inciting the people to rebellion. I have examined him in your presence and have found no basis for your charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us. As you can see, he has done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, I will punish him and then release him. Now, what Pilate is doing here has been described as offering the people a part for the whole. And I'm going to kind of explain what I mean by that. Uh, This is something that we do with negotiation sort of tactics. Uh, We we see it a lot when someone's buying or selling something. Uh, If I were, you know, if you were to try to, to take a watch, a nice watch, and take it to, you know, like a pawn shop kind of place, uh, or maybe a better sounding, you know, used items for sale kind of place, um, you could bring that watch in and you could say, well, the watch I know is worth $200. But the person who owns the shop is not going to say, okay, well, here's $200. Thank you very much. Um, Appreciate doing business with you. They're going to try to offer you a part for the whole. So they might offer you a portion. Uh, Let's say they offer $100 for the the watch. And they say, well, I'm going to offer you $100. I'm going to try to sell it for $150 and hope that I get that and hope that I make the $50 on it. Uh, Might be how they would work it out. It's actually probably a lot worse deal how it would really work out. But the thinking would be, if they offered this part for the whole, the person selling it they're assuming is more desperate for money or they wouldn't be selling it. So they figured they kind of, so to speak, hold the cards in that instance. The, the shop owner does, that is. So the shop owner thinks, I can offer them a part for the whole and because they need the money, maybe they'll take it. Now again, in, in that situation, the person can decide, well, do I really want to sell it for that amount? Um, it, it's the kind of thing that can also happen when... Anytime you're, you're getting someone to agree on the price, you know, right now we think of homes being priced really high. Uh, but that's not certainly always the case. And, and sometimes, you know, someone will come in with an offer for a home much under the asking price. All right? They'll only offer a part for the whole. And again, usually there's a strategy there where they assume the person, you know, really needs to sell or the person is looking to, to move quickly and so that they're, you know, they're going to be willing to take less at that time. So now the person can decide not to. But you can see maybe instances uh, why someone would want to do that. And so really, what we see with uh, Pilate here is him doing that because the people have come with a request. Here's Jesus. He's been talking rebellion. He's been you know, inciting the people, and we think he deserves to die. And Pilate says, well, you know, I've weighed everything. Uh, you know, to, to look at this again, he's, you know, he's examined Jesus, he brought him to Pilate, and they just didn't find that he really deserved death. So Pilate was saying, well, I'll give you a part for the whole. I will offer you, instead of executing Jesus, as he says at the very end of there, I will punish him and then release him. So what I'm going to offer you is just a part. So I'll punish him, then release him. And in his mind, he's thinking, the people are going to have to take this, right? They can't just bring someone and expect me to execute them. And so I'll just give them a the part. I'll, I'll punish him. And so maybe, you know, there's, some of the people won't be happy, but they'll know, you know, at least maybe Jesus learned a lesson that day, um, is what Pilate was probably thinking here, offering this much. But if you think about it, and if, for those of us who know how the story goes after this, the people didn't really accept this offer. Uh, you might remember they had a, what we might call a counter offer, which was crucify him. You know, they, they shouted back at him. They would take nothing less than crucifying Jesus. And you see, they knew some things about Pilate that Pilate wasn't counting on. They knew that Pilate was kind of sensitive about his job, And when they brought up the fact that, well, this Jesus says he's a king, 
And really, he's, you know, trying to pull the people away from Caesar. They knew that Pilate wasn't going to like the sound of that and so that he would eventually give in. Right? So they, again, there was a, there was a negotiation going on here for Jesus' life. If you think about it, though, what Pilate offered really isn't that great either. Right? He knew Jesus was innocent. He just said so. He just told the people, all right, I've examined him. He didn't do anything wrong. Yet, he was willing to punish him. You know, he was willing to, you know, whether that was allow the soldiers to beat him, uh, whether it was flogging him, which is a type of whip, you know, that has uh, little bits, sometimes parts of a bone or parts metal on the whip that would, you know, really rip someone's skin off uh, as they're being whipped. Sometimes people would die just from that, uh, let alone crucifixion. So, you know, from our perspective, we say, you know, Pilate was giving away too much from the beginning, even saying that this innocent man should be punished. But you can sort of imagine in his mind, he sort of think, I'm, I'm doing something good here. I'm making the people a little bit happy, and I'm not sending Jesus to be executed, right? So he sort of thought he was doing a good thing, even though really when you look at it, even just having Jesus, Jesus punished would have been too much. And the reason I bring that up, you know, we know how it turned out. We know the people demanded Jesus be crucified, and we know Pilate gave into it. But think about how we do those little negotiations when it comes to our own lives and our own actions. Uh, I'll give an example that is maybe a little less serious. Uh, sometimes we decide that we don't want to eat too much, right? Whether, whether it's dessert, whether, whether you're eating a meal of pizza or whatever it is, there might come a time when you think, well, I really shouldn't have another piece of that. And so you kind of, you, you negotiate with yourself a little bit and you have this apart for the whole thing. And literally in this case where you would say, well, I won't eat a whole piece, but I'll, I'll cut this piece in half and I'll just have that piece. And in your mind, you're thinking, I've done a good thing here. I've showed a little self-control. I didn't eat a whole piece, but I've also gotten a little bit of what I wanted. I've had, I've eaten half a piece. And then sometimes you see people going back and then cutting that half piece in half again, you know, and then adding that little more. Because again, if you're just, if you're just adding portions of pieces, it does not seem that serious to you. But now think how this relates to sin and how the devil can use this sort of negotiation tactic when it comes to us living our lives of faith or us, unfortunately, living lives of sin sometimes. You know, when we're angry at someone, maybe in the heat of the moment, there's a part of us, and maybe we say, well, you know, we're not serious about this. Right? But when we're angry, there's a part of us that say, I'd like to get that guy. And, and there's a pro we, we probably would not go to the extent of saying, yes, I want to actually murder this person. But in our minds, that, that, that's kind of you know, the worst possible thing we could do. And so we sort of say, well, I would never do that, of course. But apart for the whole, maybe. Right? You can think, well, I'm not going to physically, you know, maybe even physically hurt or certainly not murder this person, but am I going to let anger just stew in my heart for this person? Am I going to nurse a grudge every time I see them or every time I think about them? And we sort of tell ourselves, I'm kind of getting the best of both worlds here. I'm getting, I'm getting to take out that anger a little bit. And I, I, I just, I'm telling myself it's going to feel good to just seethe with, with rage a little bit at this person. And I'm also doing a good thing in not physically hurting them. So we sort of walk away from this thinking, we've done okay here. But of course the devil is the one who's, who's winning this negotiation. Because the, the burning with anger is already a sin. Right? He knows that of course it's wrong to murder someone, but it's also wrong to hate someone. And it's wrong to burn with anger with someone. And so it's really tempting for us to think, okay, I don't want to do the worst possible sin, but maybe I can take the pressure off by just doing a little slice, just doing a little bit. Because you see, the devil is, as they say, give the devil his due. He's good at what he does. He's good at tempting us. He's good at luring us away. And if you think about it, think about someone who is not willing 
to take apart for the whole, and that's the devil. Right? The Bible tells us that the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. These temptations that he brings against us aren't just sort of, you know, putting little obstacles in our path to make life harder. His goal is to devour us. His goal is to pull us away from our Savior, pull us away from our faith. And we think, well, come on, that's ridiculous. You know, that would never happen. But again, it's just like the idea of, I'm not going to eat this whole thing, but then you eat that little sliver of a slice at a time until it's all gone. The devil understands that. And he wants to tempt us to pull us away from our Savior. And again, even though none of us are going to wake up most likely one day and say, I think I'm going to turn away from God today. I think I am going to, you know, I've, I've, I've weighed all the evidence and I am going to just, I'm going to give it all up. Um, I'm going to do it all today. I was very strong in my faith up till today, but today I'm cashing in my chips, so to speak. I'm just giving it all up. We wouldn't do that, right? It's more gradual as the devil wants us to make little give in just a little bit at a time in that sin and put us in that dangerous situation. And think about how every time we sin, what we're saying to God. Because God, in his request of us, he does not, he does not give us uh, the command of a part for a whole. He doesn't say, be a good percentage of perfect. Right? Do the best you can. If you can, if you can obey me, Let's say eight times out of ten, call yourself good. No, God, God's very serious, right? He says, be perfect, as I, the Lord your God, am perfect. I mean, think about, think about at a marriage um, ceremony. If a husband and wife, you know, before they're married, they're standing up, they say their vows to each other. If, let's say the husband vowed to the wife, I will be faithful to you all but one day a year, every year. If you think about that, obviously the wife in that marriage is not going to like that, those, those terms, even though the husband would say, but again, 364 out of the 365 days, faithful. You know, that's 99.7% or thereabouts. That's pretty good, right? No, um, those kind of vows are, are not a part for the whole. It's the whole thing. Same with what our God expects of us yet we fall short. I mean, even if we were to say, okay, from now on, yeah, I've messed up in the past, but from now on, I'm going to really, I'm going to obey God perfectly. Well, first of all, we're probably going to fall short. And second of all, even if we started right now today, that wouldn't do much about the ways we've already sinned up till now. So again, thinking about this could be just an exercise in, oh man, you're right, this is really depressing and really sad and this is terrible and you know could lead us to despair if we really thought about it the full way but here's where we remember and give thanks that Jesus and what he came to do was not a part for the whole Jesus did not come to fulfill a part of what God needed doing he, he did not say you know he would obey eight of the ten commandments let's say in his life and that would be good enough no he would obey them perfectly, including and up to, you know, what we've been hearing about tonight with that Passion History reading. Jesus obeyed God perfectly up to and including death. And not just death, not just physical death, which is bad enough, but as we heard about in that Passion History reading, Jesus obeyed up to and including the full suffering of the cross, which, yes, included a terrible method of execution, terrible and painful, but he also was paying for the sins of the whole world. Not a portion of the sins, not the really bad sins, or even like the really not so bad sins, but all the sins of the world, the whole thing, Jesus took on himself. He paid for it all. There is nothing that we have done that Jesus did not pay the price for. Friends, for that, we rejoice. Even though people give in to the little strategies of a part for the whole, a pilot fell for it, and then he eventually executed Jesus anyway, we continue to fall for it, 
sometimes from the devil when we, when we give in that little bit. But this time of year is a, is a good reminder for us to turn back to the cross and thank God that Jesus never did that. Thank God that Jesus went, went the whole way, that he suffered and died for everything. And because of that, we're forgiven. We're forgiven before God. Not forgiven for most of the stuff. Not forgiven for everything after a certain point, and then after that, it's up for us to make up the rest somehow. No, the whole thing. Jesus says, and Jesus did, he did it all so that you are forgiven. And because of that, we want to serve him. Right? We, we see his commands not as a burden uh, that we have to somehow you know, live up to, to to make God happy. No, because God is happy with us in Jesus, we want to serve him. So look to Jesus. Rejoice that he went the whole way for you and then rejoice that you get an opportunity to serve him with your whole heart. Not just a part of it, but the whole thing because of the life he has given for you. Amen. And at this time, we'll continue with if I can get there, we'll continue with, oh, it's our offering break. Uh, we're, not really signing the, we're not really sending the offering plate around, though. Um, just a reminder that, that there is an offering box in the entryway. Uh, but do take this time to sign the Connect card that you find on each row. And those viewing us online can sign the online Connect card also. Thank you. Please stand for prayer. Abide with us, Lord, for it is evening and the day is almost over. Abide with us and with your whole church. Abide with us in the evening of the day, in the evening of life, in the evening of the world. Abide with us in your grace and goodness, in your holy word and sacrament, in your comfort and blessing. Abide with us when we are overcome by the night of sorrow and fear, by the night of doubt and affliction, by the night of bitter death. Abide with us and with all your people in time and in eternity. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. May God be gracious to us and bless us, and make his face shine on us. And we'll conclude our service with our final hymn. You may be seated for this hymn.
Once again, good evening and welcome to Good Shepherd. It's great to be with you here today to praise our God together and receive his gifts to us and his word. Uh, this is the last of our Wednesday services, so uh, it was great to have you here tonight. Uh, next week is Holy Week, uh, so we have our regular schedule for this coming Sunday, which is Palm Sunday uh, at 8 and 10 o'clock. And then we have, they're calling it Holy Thursday and not Maundy Thursday uh, in our hymnal. So we're going to try that name, uh, but for those of you who are used to that, it sounds weird. Uh, but Holy Thursday is next Thursday, not tomorrow, but the week after. Uh, th that service will be at 4.30 and 7 and include the Lord's Supper. And then Good Friday is that, that next day, uh, also at 4.30 and 7 p.m. And then Easter Sunday we have, uh, which again is not this coming Sunday, but the Sunday after, we have a sunrise service at 6.30 a.m. And then we have services at 8 and 10 also. Um, and between the sunrise and the 8 o'clock service, and I'm not, I don't remember the exact window of time for the breakfast. If someone knows it, you can shout it at me. But we do have a breakfast plan. Uh, so check it out or, or call the office if you need to know the times on that. Uh, with that, uh, it's great to be here with you tonight. We do have a meal uh, that you're all invited to afterwards. And then our, our family of faith night starts at 6, and you're invited to that too. Uh, but we'll say a meal prayer uh, for those of you who are joining us, or even if you're not, um, welcome to pray with us. We'll say the common table prayer. Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest, and let these gifts to us be blessed. O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Amen. Thanks. God's blessings. We'll see you again. <laughs> 